Congressman McGovern is also co-chair of both the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and the House Hunger Caucus. He also serves as co-chair of the Northeast Midwest Congressional Coalition. John Bonfaz is the co-founder and executive director of Free Speech for People, a national campaign launched on the day of the Supreme Court Citizens United ruling to challenge the misuse of corporate power and to restore democracy to the people. John previously served as the executive director and general counsel of the National Voting Rights Institute, which he founded in 1994, and as the legal director of Voter Action, a national election integrity organization. You don't often find those words together. <laughs> John is a 1992 cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School and a 1999 recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, an award granted for his innovative litigation challenging the relationship between money and politics. So you've all heard the expression, money talks. Well, I think you will find that these two gentlemen know how to raise their voices and talk back. Please welcome Congressman Jim McGovern and John Bonifaz. Well, in case you don't know, I'm Jim McGovern, um, and that's John Bonifaz, and I want to thank Rebecca for her generous introduction uh, and for being here and agreeing to be the moderator. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank uh, Representative Ellen Story and Representative Paul Mark for being here. They're both great uh, legislators. Um, those of you who are in their district should be proud of the fact that you've elected people of great integrity. and. Uh, and I want you to, to know something. I'm, Ellen says she's been there a little, has been there a little bit longer. Uh, but um, even though my district, the old district, was not near here, uh, uh, I always knew of the great works that Ellen Story was doing uh, on Beacon Hill. And uh, so when I had the opportunity to kind of you know, get these new cities and towns of my district and come out here, uh, it was especially a great thrill for me to be able to now be able to work. Uh, as a partner with Ellen, and I'm looking forward to working with her and, and Paul and so many other great people in this area. And um, before I begin, I, I probably should introduce to you, I should just say a couple of things to you. Uh, people have asked me, uh, you're from Worcester, you ever going to be out here? Absolutely, I'm going to be out here a lot. Um, and there's many times you want me out here. And we're going to open an office in Northampton on Pleasant oh, Street, and we're in the process of doing <laughs> And we have two great people here, uh, Natalie Blaze and uh, Keith Barnacle, who are in the, way in the back. But uh, those of you all probably know them, they've worked for John Over, um, who was one of my heroes. And uh, they agreed to stay with me. Um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to you know, uh, getting to work uh, on behalf of this community. Um, I, uh, I have two other staff. My district manager, uh, Kathleen Milanowicz, is here. And uh, uh, my other great staff person, Scott uh, Zoback, who does a lot of my communication work, is here as well. And so uh, I just wanted to begin by saying that uh, I am really thrilled to have this district. Um, and uh, I am looking forward to working with all of you. And I can tell uh, as I walked uh, into this room that this is a group of troublemakers. <laughs> <laughs> and I am too. Uh, so uh, I say that, I say that uh, and because um, I think, you know, uh, in Washington you hear a lot of talk about patriotism and, you know, love of country. Well, to me, patriotism and love of country also means uh, that you beckon your country to a higher standard. That when your country is doing something you disagree with, that you challenge it. You're not much of a patriot. Uh, you're not showing a great deal of love for your country if you just sit back and twiddle your thumbs when you see things are going in the wrong direction. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today. And I'm not going to speak very long. Uh, I, want, I want John to have some t uh, time here and then we'll take some questions. But um, you know, I got elected in 1996. And um, so I've been in Congress now for quite a while. And um, like every member of Congress, um, I got to get ready for every election, every two years. And what I have noticed is that every two years, it gets more and more and more expensive. Yeah. Uh, if you were to go to uh, Washington, D.C. on any particular day, 
and you went to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, or the Republican Campaign Congressional Campaign Committee, or the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, or the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, you would see members of the House and members of the Senate sitting in little cubicles, dialing for dollars, dialing for dollars, dialing for dollars. Some people do it all day, and they take breaks just to go vote. They do it because if they don't, they'll get crushed in the next election because the other side is doing it, and because we have super PACs, and because we have dreadful Supreme Court decisions like Citizens United and Buckley versus Vallejo, which say the money is free speech, which say the, say, says that corporations conduct as much money as they want in the political campaigns, and they don't even have to disclose who they are. You know, if you want to survive in politics uh, today, you have to raise money. Now, some people say, no, no, you, you really don't. You can just go out and you know, express your views. If you can't get on TV, and the other guy's on TV, you won't be heard. You can't get on the radio. You know, if you can't advertise in newspapers, you can't get direct mail out. You can't do all the things that your opponent's going to do to be able to counter whatever he or she may say. Chances are, people are going to believe all the bad stuff, because they're not going to hear from you. And especially in a congressional district, where you have hundreds of thousands of people that you represent, or in a senatorial in a campaign where it's millions of people, you can't possibly shake hands with every single person. So, you know, what do we need to do? Well, we need to figure out a way is to even the playing field a little bit. We need to figure out a way to regulate the money in politics and get as much of it out of the system as humanly possible. I, 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 am, I will, I'm telling you, as somebody who has been there now for a while, there is too much money in politics. You all know that already. You know, and, and money, and I'm talking about the excessive amounts of money, uh, I, I, I believe are corrupting our political system and undermining our democracy. Um, it is too much a part of this political process. All that time spent raising money would be better, time, better spent doing things like this, listening to people, having conversations, deliberating on issues, reading. Uh, you know, uh, deba uh, uh, de debating, uh, those are the things, quite frankly, which we want our elected officials to do more of. And, you know, uh, when you read the history of this country, the founding fathers, and I'm going to say the mothers too, um, nobody could have anticipated a system like the one we have today. I mean, we, when you listen to them, listen, read what was written about what they envisioned the House of Representatives to be, it wasn't a place where, you know, whoever could raise the most millions wins. It was a vastly different um, uh, view of what our governing system should be like than the way it is now. In some House races, and when Al in the Allen West race, I may be off by a million or two, uh, and in the Allen West race in Florida, for a House race, he raised $17 million for a House race. You know, I'm thrilled with what happened here in Massachusetts. I'm thrilled that Elizabeth Warren uh, is our new United States Senator. And I'm really <laughs> And to the credit of both her and Scott Brown, they, they said we're going to try to keep as much outside money uh, away from this race as possible. And they, they, they did, to a certain extent, do that. But they each had to raise $45 million. Well, I mean, Think about it. If, give me $90 million, and I could do a lot of good things in Massachusetts. Look at the presidential rates. When you add everything up, it's over a billion dollars that was spent on the presidential race. The benefits, a handful of broadcasters and mostly political consultants. But you give me a billion dollars, I can help end poverty in a few states, uh, which is a better use of that money uh, than just to enhance the pockets of political consultants. Issues that should be debated, important issues that should be debated in the halls of Congress aren't being debated because of money. They're afraid they're going to risk offending a special interest, a special <coughs> corporate interest in particular. Give me one example. For a year, I, I think I tried a dozen times, a dozen different times in the Rules Committee to bring an amendment to the floor that simply said, that we will no, the U.S. taxpayers will no longer subsidize big oil companies. All right. Now there may be people out there who think that we should still subsidize big oil companies. Fine. You know, we want to debate that. Go ahead and do it. 
Uh, but I think since they're earning a zillion dollars a year in profits, that we could take those subsidies and maybe give it to solar, or give it to wind, or give it to tidal, or give it to something good and green and, and create a whole new new economy. But it, whether you are with me or against me on that issue, it's a legitimate issue. I don't think anybody would, even those who want to continue to advocate for the oil industry. Yet, it was denied. The Republican leadership denied me every single time. Why? Because they're afraid to offend one of their biggest corporate contributors, the oil industry. It provides lots of money, not only directly to them, but to a whole bunch of these so-called new super PACs. And, you know, and again, you know, this is just one example. Uh, and so, you know, every once in a while we, we kind of get squeaked through with what we need to get and we get some good votes. But more and more and more you're seeing the power of big money and the power of corporations. As I mentioned, the Supreme Court to me has, um, and John is, a, is an expert on this and he will fill you in on it, but the, the Supreme Court has made some really bad decisions. Um, I, I, and I went back and, you know, the preamble to the Constitution, I, I, you know, I get new bifocals, so I'm thinking maybe I'm missing something, but it still says we the people. You know, it doesn't say we the corporations. You know, it says we the people. And you're people. I'm people. You know, corporations are people. You know, they don't have kids. They don't go to war in Afghanistan. You know, I mean, you know, they don't, you know, have any of the issues that people have. Corporations are artificial entities that we the people have created. Now, I'm not here, it's not a rant against all corporations. You know, I mean, there are corporations and they employ people and, you know, that's all fine and good. And, you know, this is not about saying, you know, I'm against all corporations. What I'm saying is that corporations need to be regulated by people. And, and, and so I have two amendments. The, uh, two bills that I've introduced, and again, I hate the, I hate amending the Constitution. I, I don't like the I, uh, it's just, it, well. Let me put it this way: I, I'm very I don't want to say hate. I, I'm very reluctant to amend the Constitution. But there's only two ways to kind of deal with this issue, because right now, if Congress were to pass a campaign finance reform bill to limit how much campaigns cost, it would be deemed unconstitutional. So it wouldn't, you know. The McCain-Feingold bill, which was a super, super, super modest campaign reform measure, was most of it was deemed unconstitutional. So, how do you deal with that? You get two ways: we get a couple of more good people in the Supreme Court, and they can switch everything around, and that'll be wonderful. Or you have to do this constitutional amendment route, um, and which is arduous. John will explain to you it is not an easy thing to do. It's been done in the past, and it's been done in ways that have been very progressive and positive. Um, but, you know, those are the only two choices we have. I guess there's a third choice where you can throw up your hands and say, there's nothing we can do. We'll just be quiet, that's, that's just the way it is. Um, and um, so I've got two bills. One basically says that, you know, the men's constitution, you give Congress the authority to regulate what is raised and what is spent in political campaigns. So we can say you can't raise more than X, or you can't spend more than X. And it will, it will, it, if we pass this amendment, it would stand, would stand constitutional muster. The other would overturn the Citizens United case, but also do some other things. It basically says we're going to amend the Constitution to make it clear that corporations are not people. You know, uh, I disagree with Mitt Romney, who said they were. <laughs> um, they're not. You know, they're just not. And um, and I and and the reason why this second bill is important is not just in terms of campaign finance. It's not just about super PACs and undisclosed money and unlimited amount of money. There's something else going on here beyond you know buying campaigns. Um, it's this whole corporate personhood movement which is moving toward overturning statutes that deal with things like tobacco, labeling on tobacco products or uh, labeling on, you know, with regard to genetically modified foods, things like that, where corporations are going into courts and getting uh, these statutes reversed based on kind of their rights as persons. Um, and again, 
I mean, I, 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 gotta, I gotta go back, I'm gonna start reading all my history all over again. I don't believe that anybody, you know, who was during the founding of our country envisioned that we would get to a point that we are right now. And my final thing that I'm gonna say is that, um, you know, uh, to do what I'm, what I'm suggesting to do here is not going to be easy. Um, and there are critics uh, who say that, um, you know, that if we were to do, say the corporation were not people, that somehow we would ban the rights of the press. Um, and uh, Justice Alioto um, made that claim in, with regard to the Citizens United uh, case. And, um, and, uh, and the New York Times actually did a really good piece, which is which said it's, that it's not the corporate structure of media companies that make them deserving of constitutional protections; it is their function. So this notion that somehow, you know, we would be giving Congress the ability to regulate the press if we pass this is really a bunch of garbage. It's a, it's a, it's just to get you to look at you know, the shiny little, little thing over here, so you don't really look at what, what the reality is over here. And it's the, it's what, it's what they do. But I think as difficult as it's going to be to get something like this up for a direct vote, we're going to, I'm going to try to use some procedural measures to try to get this debate going every which way we can. But I want to have a debate this year. I want people to talk about this issue. I want people to go talk to their members of Congress all throughout Massachusetts and all throughout the country. I want them to talk to the United States Senators and say, what are you doing about this? What are you doing about this? Because you can assume we're going to get to the point of no return. Soon it's going to be so out of hand that we're going to have no voice at all. Mm -hmm. And when people say, why are you doing this? It's simply because I believe that ordinary people ought to have power. It's just that simple. I mean, I think, you know, regular people, no matter what their status in life, ought to be able to figure out what direction they want their country to move in. It shouldn't be just the people with a lot of money. It shouldn't just be the people who are, it shouldn't just be the people who are associated with big special interests, and it shouldn't just be corporations. Regular people, you should matter more than one representative from a corporation or one representative of a super PAC. And so this really is about trying to make sure that we restore power back to the people. And um, and I'm going to tell you, I think you all know this already. I mean, this is a problem. Uh, and so I'm, we're hoping to get a little movement together and to get this discussion going um, and to make it difficult for people to avoid talking about this. And in the next, and, and, and we're going to debate it in Congress as much as we can, and in the next round of elections, you know, during debates, we, we don't want moderators to ask these candidates, where are you on this issue? Well, you know, and if you, if you believe corporations are people, please defend that, uh, that assertion to the people that, uh, that you want to represent. So I appreciate you being here, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our good friend John Bonham. Yeah, um, thank you, Congressman McGovern. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for moderating this. Thank you for all of you for coming out on this critical question of our time. I, I just want to first say how proud I am to be a new constituent of Congressman Jim McGovern. Uh, you know, he is on the vanguard on this question of our time, of whether it's we the people or we the corporations. He is at the forefront in the United States Congress on this. When history records what the American people did to respond to the Citizens United ruling to defend our democracy, that history will record the critical role that Congressman Jim McGovern of Massachusetts played in the United States Congress in helping to propel this movement. So we really appreciate your leadership. Uh, Free Speech for People, as Rebecca mentioned, was launched on the day of the Citizens United ruling. Maybe I should back up here a little bit. Um, it was launched on the day of the Citizens United ruling to press for a constitutional amendment to overturn the ruling and to reclaim our uh, democracy. And since that time, we've seen a growing movement all across the country clamoring uh, for this very kind of effort in the United States Congress for constitutional amendments that will defend our democracy. There are many other groups involved 
uh, in this, but with all of us collectively, we've seen now 11 states on record calling for an amendment, including Massachusetts. I know Representative Story, Representative Mark were part of that historic victory last year in Massachusetts, uh, being part of that list of states that have called for an amendment. 500 plus <coughs> cities and towns across the country uh, have called for this as well, including major cities like Boston, Seattle, New York, and Los Angeles, but many, many small cities and towns too as well here in Massachusetts. Uh, and so this is a vibrant movement that is taking to uh, many parts of the country. The last two states that joined this list were Montana and Colorado that did so with voters passing ballot initiatives calling for this constitutional amendment this past November. Now, many people think, well, this is only an issue that's going to appeal to a certain part of the political spectrum. Well, that's actually not true. We've done some polling with Peter Hart, a Hart Research Associate, that shows across the political spectrum, people agree the government is up for and by the people, and that corporations are not people with constitutional rights. 68% of Republicans, according to that public and opinion research, support uh, a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United and to make clear corporations are not people with constitutional rights. It's higher among Democrats and independents, 82% independents, 87% of Democrats, but we have a common vision here of what we believe America should be, and it is we the people, not we the corporations. So in Montana, you know, which many people understand to be a red state, 55% of the electorate there voting for Governor Romney to be President of the United States, 75% voting to pass a ballot initiative to call for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. Don't let anyone tell you that only Democrats or only people left to center care about this issue. I think the Montana vote proves that. 75% in Colorado uh, as well. Th there are two problems, as Congressman McGovern has so eloquently stated, that come out of the Citizens United ruling. The first problem is this problem of unlimited campaign spending which predates Citizens United, which goes back to the 1976 Supreme Court ruling of Buckley v. Vallejo, equating money with speech and sanctioning today's system of unlimited campaign spending. There was a law that was before the court at that time that had been passed by Congress in the wake of the Watergate scandal to uh, deal with the problem of campaign finance, and they passed mandatory spending limits. And because of that ruling, uh, that law was struck down, and we've had ever since then this system of elections up to the highest bidder becoming auctions. Uh, and, and that problem needs to be addressed, as, as the congressman said. Now, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. <laughs> and that problem needs to be, I actually don't need a mic, if you probably already tell. But, uh, that, that, that problem needs to be dealt with with the constitutional amendment, unless this congressman says we're going to wait for a new make with the Supreme Court. We need to overturn the Buckley ruling and, and, and the Citizens United ruling that followed it on this basic point that the Congress and the states shall have the authority to create limits on campaign spending so that we can have a level playing field, so that public funding systems you know, can be effective, so we don't have to deal with those outside the public funding system. We're going to try to outspend the Treasury. So campaign finance reform is going to be protected and defended by that constitutional amendment bill. The other problem is, as the Congressman said, this problem of the fabricated doctrine of corporate constitutional rights. A doctrine that the framers never intended. You know, James Madison spoke of corporations as, quote, a necessary evil subject to proper limitations and guards. Thomas Jefferson said, quote, he hoped to crush in its birth the aristocracy of our money corporations. And for two centuries, for two centuries, the U.S. Supreme Court and federal courts State courts followed the framers' mandate. They understood that corporations were not to be treated as people under the First Amendment. There was prior rulings uh, back in the late 1800s and 1900s that dealt with this idea of corporations being treated as people under the Due Process Clause. But by the time of the New Deal era, that doctrine had become dormant, and it got resurrected in the early 1970s by a private attorney named Lewis Powell, working with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, as a consultant, and he advised how corporate America could fight back against all these public interest laws getting passed in that era to protect the environment, to protect our health care, to protect civil rights and campaign finance. And his advice, through this secret memorandum that was never to see the light of day, was to advance the notion of 
corporate speech, that corporations have free speech rights too. Then, as you probably know, Lewis Powell became Justice Lewis Powell, nominated by then President Nixon, confirmed by the Senate, again, with no knowledge of this memorandum, and appointed to the court. And he became an architect of this corporate rights doctrine, this fabricated <coughs> doctrine of corporate speech. And that doctrine has been used to strike down all kinds of public interest laws over the past uh, three decades. But the Citizens United ruling is the most extreme extension of that doctrine, and that's why we need a constitutional amendment to set it right, to make clear that corporations are not people with constitutional rights. You know, we all have rights if we're individual working in a corporation, in a nonprofit, we all have those rights that are still going to be protected. But the artificial entity that we create, that we charter, is governed by us, we the people, not the other way around. Now, I, I just want to address, uh, finally, the, the point that sometimes, not probably in this room, but maybe your friends, maybe your neighbors, maybe your family will say, well, that's all well and good. You know, Congressman McGovern's a nice guy, but this is pie in the sky. You know, there is no way you can amend the Constitution. Uh, we, we have three responses at Free Speech for People on this point, and, and I urge you to take this uh, to your friends and, and your neighbors. First, remind them that we have done this before, 27 times before, seven times to overturn egregious Supreme Court rulings. We've done this to defend our democracy and to expand our democracy. We can and we must do it again. Second, this is a critical opportunity that we have. As much as it is a dangerous moment, it is an opportunity because we are united on this question as a people. As that polling has shown, as the Montana and Colorado votes have shown, we have a common vision in this country, a government of, for, and by the people. And that is why an amendment is possible on this question. And finally, if those arguments don't work with your friends and your neighbors, then remind them the story of Doris Haddock otherwise known as Granny D. As many of you may know, she decided at the age of 89 to walk across the country to overhaul our nation's campaign finance system. She set out from California walking 10 miles a day. She didn't have any grand plan as to how she was going to do this, how she was going to be housed, how she was going to be fed. She, she knew the general direction she was supposed to walk, <laughs> but, but she just started to walk. And random strangers came out of their homes. They housed her. They fed her. They walked with her for part of the way. She walked through the rain, through the wind, through the snow. She crossed country ski in places. 3,200 miles later, 14 months later, turning 90 in the process, she reached Washington, D.C. to be greeted by then Senator Russ Feingold, and Senator John McCain and hundreds of others there that day. I was honored to have been among those greeting her that day, and I was honored to have known her and to have worked with her. She passed away in March of 2010, two months after the Citizens United ruling at the age of 100. And by the way, when she heard of the Citizens United ruling, she thought about walking across the country <laughs> again. But when she passed away, I thought about the fact that when she was born, when she was born, the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing women the right to vote, had yet to be enacted. She saw in her lifetime nine amendments passed by two-thirds of the Congress, ratified by three-quarters of the states. She is an example that change can happen in a lifetime, including a constitutional amendment. In the name of Granny D, it is time for a constitutional amendment to lift up that promise of American democracy and make it clear that we the people shall govern in America. Thank you very much. So at this point, we're going to open it up for questions. And I think the acoustics are such that you can just stand and we'll try that. So um, first question. Yes, back there. What can we do to help you get this through? Uh, what we can do here in Massachusetts is we can make sure that every member of Congress in Massachusetts is a co-sponsor of these two bills, HR 20 and HR, I'm sorry, HJ Res 20 and HJ Res 21. Uh, and we need a Senate sponsor. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we, you might want to talk to Senator Warren and um, Senator Markey or whoever the senator could be. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, we're going to have one senator um, uh, to see where they'll introduce it. And then, you know, obviously people have networks here. Uh, and, 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 you know, John kind of talked about this a little bit, but look, I mean, you know, there's a lot of people, it, one individual has a lot of power. I mean, through letters to the editor, to op-eds, to calling on radio stations, to writing your, you know, your family and friends you communicate with only during holidays. Um, you know, just to ask them to send a note to their representative and their uh, senator. And, um, or, you know, and then we get a little bit bolder and ask people to start speaking about this on the House floor. I, I just say the, the, the House Democratic Caucus seems to be kind of beginning to get this message. Uh, I was telling people the American people are ahead of Congress on so many issues. They're ahead of Congress on the wars, they're ahead of Congress on this, and it takes a while for Congress to catch up. But uh, uh, Leader Pelosi has put together a task force, I wanted, to focus on this very issue of campaign finance reform, of, a, of, of bringing a constitutional amendment forward to try to deal with some of these egregious uh, Supreme Court rulings. And whether it is going to be my specific bills verbatim or they're going to change them, is, doesn't matter. We need to move this effort forward. And it's old-fashioned grassroots campaigning. That's it. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, that, that's how you move mountains in this country, uh, unless you have a pile of money. Uh, but I mean, it's, that's what we need you to do. And we should start here in Massachusetts and then expand from there. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that, uh, you know, first we're going to have a pretty important Senate election in this state. Yep. And there are not going to be other elections competing with it, so the country's going to be focused on this Senate election. I think it would be wonderful to make this a, a key question asked of the candidates in that race. Where do you stand on Citizens United? And where do you stand on the question of a constitutional amendment to overturn it? The other thing I would add is we have materials here and a sign-up sheet. We'd love for you to join this campaign of free speech for people and to help us as the congressman has said reach other people around the country. We need the Massachusetts delegation on board with these amendment bills, but we need many, many others around the country on board with it. And we need to reach the other states that have yet to pass these kinds of resolutions at the state legislative level or even in their cities and towns. So, uh, you know, if you're in, if you know people in, in these other uh, states, we need to get to 38 that, to ratify. So we're more than a quarter of the way there in showing that the states are ready to help ratify this kind of amendment. But we've got a ways to go to demonstrate that even more states are on board, and we'd love to get your help on that. And, and finally, you know, we want the President of the United States to stand up and be vocal about this as well. Now, he has, um, to his credit, come out in support of an amendment. He did that in August uh, in an online discussion. But we want him to elevate this to a level like the State of the Union Address, which is happening on February 12th. So we have initiated, with a number of other groups, an online petition on the White House website calling on President Obama to include this call for a constitutional amendment in his State of the Union Address. And you can go to the White House website, you can sign on there uh, to that petition and tell your friends about it and urge that the President also exercise leadership on this critical question. I should also tell you too that we're, we have initiated a letter that we're circulating among some co colleagues who are sympathetic to get to the White House to ask the President to do the same thing. You should talk about this issue in the State of the Union. Next question. Yes. Sorry. <clears throat> it was disappointing during the presidential campaign that climate was scarcely mentioned, and I suspect this was due to it being a third rail issue among potential contributors. But I was gratified that the president, in his recent talk, expressed some encouraging remarks about it. And I hope that he follows his words with actions. But in the climate consideration, there has been uh, concern about air pollution and carbon dioxide, but not much mention about soil degradation, which I think is of vital importance with our need for food. Right. And I think in your role in the Agricultural Committee, I hope that there's more attention paid to that. I will, and I, I will say I, I, I was I was disappointed with the lack of talk about climate change uh, issues during the presidential campaign, but I was really uh, lifted up by the president's uh, uh, inaugural address. Uh, you know, I, I, I get to sit on the inaugural podium, and because I've been around now for a while, I was actually 
like from here to you from Beyonce and Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> after, after she sang, I gave her the thumbs up, but then I found her she lip synced. I could have done that. <laughs> but I, I thought that I thought that his you know, I look at to me that was a signal that, that, that in this this second term, uh, this is gonna be an issue. He wouldn't I, I don't think he would have elevated that issue to that level if he did it. And so this is our opportunity. Um, and one of the things, you know, it's a little bit off, but one of the things we need to we do a better job at it is communicating to people that when we talk about kind of our response to climate change, that, it, that, that it's not punitive. That what we're talking about is improving the environment, but also creating a whole new set of jobs. You know, this whole kind of new, you know, uh, endless amount of, of jobs that can be created, put people back to work. Uh, and the other side has been very good at kind of saying, oh no, you're gonna, you, you, you won't be able to have lights on your house all the time, or you won't be able to do, it is, you know. We need to get pushed back, you know, we, we're looking for jobs, here's where the jobs are gonna be. Here's the, this is the economy of tomorrow. Yes, and so I, to follow up on the grassroots and what we can right. do, do you have like a single um, stop shopping for grassroots materials? On, for we do, uh, if you go to freespeechforpeople.org, there's actually a, toolkit that you can download. There's a lot of things you can help uh, distribute in the field. Um, th there are a lot of ways to get these resolutions that have been passed at the state level also to get them passed at the local level. And, you know, we're not just talking only about governmental bodies. It's great when city council passes it or a town meeting passes it, but it's also great to have a community association pass it or a campus uh, pass it. You know, I think there's a lot of ways to have our voices heard on this, and the resolution we have model language that you can use uh, to adapt from. Uh, but I think there's a lot of opportunities there to spread the word. I, I see Tim Carpenter here, who I know has been doing a lot of key work on this question as well from Progressive Democrats of America, and we really appreciate everything you've been doing. Tim, do you want to add on the grassroots what, what's been happening on this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm late. I just got in from um, DC. We're trying to find you some co sponsors, Congressman McGovern. I'm Tim Carpenter, Progressive Democrats of America. As John indicated, we're working very much on the uh, grassroots level. Uh, it's nice when you have a Congress member like Jim McGovern, but we need to get outside of our bubble uh, and reach out and find co-sponsors. And one of the ways we can do that is, uh, John said, is working within our communities, but also asking your friends and neighbors and uh, relatives across the country to get in contact with their Congress member. We're going to have to build this one Congress member at a time to find the co-sponsors uh, to follow Jim's leadership. So that's one thing I would really implore, uh, if you can be a part of that. Also, I just want to pass out, on Saturday during Inaugural Week, Congressman McGovern was with us, and we had a forum where we talked specifically about these issues, where he talked about it, until we get uh, the money out of politics and get the corporations to allow us to get back, um, and as um, I'm sure our speakers indicated, to get that $6 billion of filter back to the grassroots. Uh, we uh, gathered last Saturday with Congressman McGovern and other activists like yourselves for over eight hours, in Washington, specifically at the Progressive Summit, to talk about how we can move on these issues. So I encourage you to take a look at that literature and be a part of it. And again, I thank Congressman McGovern and John for your leadership, and glad I could sneak in here under the wire to lend my voice, and thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm Lois Barber. I live in Amherst. And um, there are, you talked about two amendments, one on the Vallejo piece and the other one on, on the current uh, Citizens United. Is the strategy to move them both along the side by side, or are you pushing on one or the other? I think the strategy is to push them both. The strategy is to push them both. And, um, uh, and, uh, and, I, uh, and again, I, I think they complement each other really nicely. And again, and again, you know, if we get to the point where we can actually get a bill to the floor, it, it may be the combination of both. Uh, but I think it's just more to, to, to move them both. Some people are a little, I, I will be honest with you, there are some members of Congress who get really nervous about being on a bill that says corporations are not people because they're afraid they'll offend corporations. Uh, a lot of people in the corporate world, and we had a press conference in uh, Boston yeah, yesterday, 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 yesterday. Um, yeah. um, where you know, we had someone who talked about the fact that a lot of cor corporate leaders don't believe in this new corporate person doc doctrine. Um, so some, there are some people who are a little bit nervous about that. Uh, but may feel more comfortable with the uh, the one that just gives Congress the right to regulate uh, the raising and spending of, of money. But we're pushing both. Yeah, and, and I'll just add on that. You know, there is a Senate companion 
to Congressman the Governor's bill on limiting campaign spending. That's been introduced by Senator Tom Udall, uh, will be reintroduced in this session, has 24 Senate co-sponsors. There is not, importantly yet, a, a companion on the, in the Senate side to the People's Rights Amendment, the one that would overturn corporate constitutional rights. So that's another thing that we can all do here in Massachusetts, is to push our Senate uh, leadership uh, to get behind Congressman Governor's People's Rights Amendment and introduce it in the Senate. But we need that debate in both chambers. And it is true, you know, that uh, people get uh, pushed down the, these, these detour lanes or the, the shiny apple, as, as Congressman McGovern highlighted, into these uh, unintended consequences type discussions. Well, this is going to tear down uh, religious institutions or this is going to tear down the media. And none of it is <coughs> true. You know, reporters, producers, editors, they are the ones who have constitutional rights, not the corporate entity uh, that, that has been chartered by the state to exist. That's not what is constitutional rights. And the members of a church or a synagogue, uh, you know, those are the those are the people who have constitutional rights. They're natural persons. So these are really false arguments. But we have lived for the past three decades under this claim somehow that we need these artificial entities to have constitutional rights to protect our individual rights, and that's just not true. And that's an educational process that has to take place in the country and in the Congress. Um, I don't have a question, but I just want to thank you for pushing this uh, two amendments. I've been waiting for them for a long time. <laughs> a long, long time. Um, it goes way back. Uh, I'm glad we had to do it. And I want to let you know that I support you all the way. Thank you. Thank you. like him, 
And again, I think we had a secret vote. There'd be a lot of people with us. Uh, but, you know, we don't have a secret vote. So, uh, but we do have Republicans. And, and I'll just add on the grassroots strategy side of this, you know, there were plenty of skeptics who, when this campaign and other efforts were launched around Citizens United, said, you know, there's not going to be any staying power of a constitutional amendment call. It's just not going to last. And I think we've proven those skeptics wrong with 11 states now on record. We see a realistic goal by the end of 2014, in two years' time, having another 10 plus states, nearly half of the country, on board calling for an amendment. Not just the work we're doing, but public citizen, people for the American way, common cause, move to amend, all these other groups. And, you know, Congressman mentioned the business community. We partnered with the American Sustainable Business Council, which was represented at this Boston press conference yesterday. 2,000 plus business leaders are on board calling uh, for this kind of an amendment. So we're going to work uh, in a variety of communities to reach people across the political spectrum. We fully agree, and you know, we've got to reach Republicans and independents. That's why we helped put it on the ballot in Montana with Common Cause, because we wanted to show that Republican voters would come out and, and vote for this. But you know, we've, we've got to build it further from the grassroots as well. And I think if we see half the country already in terms of the number of states on board by the end of 2014, and we keep moving to the next presidential election, it will be very, very difficult to ignore this question in that presidential election uh, as it you know, was in this past cycle. Yes, Yeah, Leo Maley. Uh, I appreciate that both of you uh, started out uh, talking some about the problems of money in politics, and we all uh, probably agree with that, but I want to make a case also that money is very good in politics. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have defeated an incumbent uh, Republican congressperson, and we would not have you in the Congress doing this. Uh, otherwise, Paul Mark would not have won a contested race for his state rep seat, and we would not have him at the state house doing the things that he's doing. So our money needs to be put behind our values. But my real question was, I love the numbers that John gives. 87% of Democrats support this. I won't worry about the Republicans today. Why don't we have 87% of Democrats in Congress supporting your amendment? For real. For real. And what do we do about them? You've mentioned the ones in Massachusetts. And for real, not just saying call them up or whatever, but for real. Well, we, yeah. well, we, well we need to convince people that, uh, you know, that, that they need to get on measures um, and you know and, and, and quite frankly there's some members who just haven't thought about it, uh, you know because they haven't been asked about it so we, we need to we, that's where the grassroots uh, really, really matters there are some Democrats you know who are benefiting from you know corporate uh, benefactors uh, you know just like the Republicans I mean when I talk about the, all this money kind of corrupting our political system I mean it's a bipartisan problem to be honest with everybody here. And I do, you know, I appreciate, you know, the, you, you kind of talk about the good money. I mean, I, I should say when I when I ran for Congress in 1996 against Peter Blue, I was supposed to lose. Mm -hmm. I was outspent. Yes. I was outspent in that race. Luckily, that they, they thought I was such a long shot that more of these outside groups came, didn't come in because they thought I was dead. Um, <laughs> uh, and in fact, on election night in 1996, I had, my, my, I had, I had uh, I could afford uh, uh, one week of, of, uh, of advertisement before the election. My commercial was, if you wouldn't vote for Newt, why would you vote for Blue? I don't know what I would have done if I ran against Peter Tolkien. <laughs> 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 but, uh, uh, but, but I was outspent, and I, and I squeaked through. Um, and on election night, the media at 801 said I lost. Uh, and then I, then they eventually changed their mind. But, <laughs> Because the votes came in. But here's the deal. Um, you know, I think that those of us kind of with, I'm a liberal, or also progressive, whatever, those of us with values, uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think, I think we can win on our ideas. You know, I don't think we need to have a situation you know, where we outspend somebody, you know, 20 to 1 in order to be able to win. Uh, I really do. I, 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 think, I, think, I think people really do, you know, most people think the way we do. I, mean, I, I was watching Rachel Maddow last night. I don't know how many of you saw her. She says, you know, how many people think of themselves as liberal and there's like a small number? 
But then you look at all the liberal programs, Social Security, like 92% of it. Medicare, 98%, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, environmental protection, 82%. Um, even, you know, uh, marriage equality, I mean, a majority support this. And these are, I would argue, all liberal initiatives. Now, I think on our ideas, I think most people, I think we really do represent the mainstream. Um, if we have an, an even playing field. And, but the problem with this money is we don't have an even playing field. And it's going to get worse. And you know, and for all the good money that we're going to be putting in the campaigns, I'm going to tell you, um, you know, we've just seen the beginning of what Citizens United means. I mean, they, these guys are just kind of dipping their toes in to see what they can do and what they can't do. Um, we're not going to have, I don't care, all the good people in the world here, all of the, the union movement, we're never going to be able to raise the money if they go full blast all in on this. So, you know, we need to stop this now. We need to stop this now. And, um, and, I, and again, I mean, it, it, I, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say it, it's corrupting the system, Democrats and Republicans. This is a bipartisan problem, and, uh, and it's, it, it's a bipartisan hurdle to overcome in order to get this stuff scheduled. But I think a strong grassroots movement can, can move, move mountains. I just say one final thing. I want to thank everybody in this room over the years who have been pushing for an end to this war in Afghanistan. Yeah. Because I think, I think we are moving in that direction. And you, ought know, you ought to know this. We would not be moving in that direction if people weren't put pressure on members of Congress and on the White House. Believe me, we would not be moving in that direction. I mean, the, the tone that is coming out of the White House is dramatically different today than it was only two years ago. And that's not because everybody all of a sudden got religion on the issue. That's in large part because of the pressure all across the country, people demanding an end to these wars. Yes. Um, I would like to, uh, to sort of pull Leo Maley's um, question and turn it around to the House congressman. If 87% of Democrats were in favor of, of, of some changes, and I've forgotten the Republican, but it was pretty high somewhere in the 60s, why not a grassroots effort within the House? Certainly there's a representative um, representation of close to those numbers of House members who might want to take a look at it from their own personal uh, perspective as well to bring them closer together. If those, if those numbers indeed reflect the general population, why, why wouldn't it represent members of the House? Because the general population is ahead of Congress on so many things. Uh, and and unless that 87% weigh in, you know, then you can't automatically assume that 87% of the of those House Democrats are going to do the right thing. You know, if we get 87% of the Democrats that want to get on this bill, I'd, I'd file a discharge petition. Um, and a discharge petition would allow, I mean, if you, if you get 218 signatures, you can bypass all the committees and it goes automatically to the floor for a vote. So if we had that kind of co-sponsorship, then we'd be pushing for a discharge petition, you know, to move it that way, to go around it. That's one way around it. And we have to get a few Republicans to join with us. So there are, there, depending on how we move on this, depending on what happens in the next few months, again, we just introduced this on uh, last week. Uh, so, and then we're off this week, uh, next week, and, uh, and then we're in for two days, and then we're off, and then another fiscal cliff, just so you, in case you missed the last one. Uh, <laughs> for a while. So, you know, we, we, we haven't had a, even had a chance really to, to talk to one another, uh, other than at the inauguration. So, um, you know, we, we're going we're to push the co-sponsors, and if we, if, we, if we get a little wind behind our back, then we can look at some other ways to try to force this issue. So, um, you know, it's heavy public, tell them. Are there any people in our House delegation that have signed on? Yeah, uh, so by Capuano. Yeah. Congressman Neal was on last uh, session. So but everybody else on. needs to be encouraged. Right, everybody needs to be encouraged. <coughs> okay, thank you. Know. Yes. And I'd also remind everybody, it took us 20 months to get Congressman Neal on board. Right. We were in his office every month. So those of you that are in that district, he needs to hear from us right away but to ask him to but come up it. again. Right. But you did it. Right. Absolutely. No, you, you speak to citizens' right. power. That was an example, Congressman. Right. No, okay. that's, a, that's an example. You got right there. I mean, you know, the, you know kind of these visits make a difference. And uh, even in our own delegation where, you know, look, I mean, again, I mean, 
Well, you all know this. I mean, you know, you, you, get, you get elected to office, you probably want to stay in office. <laughs> so, you know, how do you avoid controversial issues? How do you avoid not, you know, being, being targeted? You know, you, you kind of, you know, you pick your battles very carefully. You stay, a lot of people stay, you know, pretty, pretty low. You know, you, you don't 